I'm just trying to, uh, the recording is on. Right, so welcome back. And um, yeah, we've, uh, uh, we've, we've spent the last two hours uh, just discussing on challenges in marriage. The last hour we looked at how certain practical ways of how we could overcome uh, challenges. We're going to um, spend some time looking at certain challenges and what are the biblical instructions that are given um, for specific challenges um, that that people do face. <clears throat> you know, what the scriptures say um, in a couple of areas. One is when there is a spouse that is unsaved, if there is a divorce uh, and marriage, if there is the death of a spouse, and death and remarriage. So we're going to be looking at biblical instructions of, of the, these four um, specific uh, areas uh, because I think uh, it's good to know what scripture has instructed in these areas. So we're going to be reading a lot of scriptures uh, and from there we will uh, pick up truths that we have uh, found. Okay, so... Um, when we look at the first, one of the first areas that uh, uh, comes across as a challenge. Does somebody have a question? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, when we look at the one of the first uh, uh, life challenges is <clears throat> when there is an unsaved spouse <clears throat> or a spouse who is not a believer. Um, in the unit, of, uh, in, in the marriage unit. So uh, this could probably happen through very many ways. You know, either both partners uh, chose to get married before they were believers or they decided, the, the couple decided to marry when one was an unbeliever. So uh, it it is a possibility that uh, one of you could be the only believer in the family and the spouse is not in the Lord. And uh, this can create a lot of challenges and difficulties because of the differences that one sees in faith. Um, and I'm sure there are many times that y'all also would have personally come across people who face these challenges. I, I just want to open this up and ask as to, you know, what have you noticed to be difficulties that a saved and an unsaved spouse faces um, when they are married together? So would, uh, you know, maybe out of your observations you've seen or what have been the differences that have some often led to this uh, um, conflict? Okay. Uh, I, I'm just going to pause. I think, Shri Kumar, you have a question on the assignment? Yes, Pastor. I have a question on assignment. Yes. Can I ask? Go ahead. Pastor, um, Go ahead. there is a problem which I'm facing. Um, uh -huh. Like, uh, it's marking wrong even um, uh, even few questions, which is, uh, hmm. even if we, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, it is not taking it in the right way. It's actually marking okay. uh, almost everything wrong, like, so okay. how how we will let, like, correct it? Even okay. that don't, prayer, if you mentioned it, that was so extremely long. <laughs> All right. So don't, don't worry about it. The reason okay. is because I have not put an answer key there. Okay. Well, and even so there is anything... certain answer key is also there, but that also it is showing wrong, actually. Okay. Because you know that why? is a proper sentence. You Maybe you have ah. given. So, right. But I so... have only put two points. Maybe that is there in the sentence. But, no problem. Uh, so the answer, the reason why uh, I some of them I've left blank is because you know you may be, use different words to mean the same thing. So yeah, don't oh, okay. worry about it. Okay, each uh, each assess assignment that assessment that comes back comes back. I look through the entire thing. So I will manually mark it again. So don't thank worry okay, if you're getting you. zero out of thirty five. <laughs> don't worry. All right, because I'm going to manually look through each of your assessments and you will i will return it to you with the uh, marked one okay so 
don't be perturbed by what you see. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks. Okay. All right. Yeah, okay. Because it's it's a machine. It's a program. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So. Um, yeah, so I'm opening up the question. What do you think uh, have been the challenges that you've seen when uh, an unbeliever and a believer uh, joins together in marriage? What have you all seen as uh, um, conflicts that happen? Yes, Charles, please go ahead. I hope we can hear you. It's always good to hear your thoughts, Charles. How about now? Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Praise the Lord. Uh, when, <clears throat> when one of the spouses is not saved, I have I I saw that challenge. For instance, uh, one of the spouse uh, was still taking uh, was smoking and taking alcohol, and the. The lady would be now the one to to wash them, to to clean, and this man would come when they are totally totally drenched with with alcohol and they cannot even shift their legs. Sometimes they would call her, "Your husband has failed to move. Come and help," and she would go and pick. It, it would be very low outlook the way the society is looking at the the the, the spouse is totally different is like this is a failed marriage this is something that is failing but uh, one of the reasons as I have said is the the society uh, what they are looking at them and the way they are making comments and again it it would Another point would lower the esteem of the spouse who is already saved because he's like, why me? Why doesn't he change? Am I praying wrongly? I have prayed for my spouse to get saved, but he's not getting saved. Mm -hmm. So such things can be lingering in the brains, in the mind of the, of the spouse who is already saved, I guess, and then the society would be looking at them differently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, Shri Kumar, I think you had uh, you had an observation. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Uh, Pastor, um, yeah. Um, as an unbeliever, um, uh, we can say this. Uh, I observe these things like um, um, for them, the marriage is uh, like their family is forcing them to do. There is no, uh, there is no uh, counseling in their marriage, uh, you know, and uh, they just look that okay. Uh, now the now the person is now uh, now the now the age as per their age now they, he or she has to get married, and they just uh, you know they just find a good uh, proposal and they just do it, and uh, there is no uh, there is no formal uh, counseling training and uh, you know. Um, is given to them and um, for them many times it is just just a usual thing or a casual thing they can they can anytime they can uh, uh, they can just uh, get into wrong things and uh, there are it, it doesn't mean that every marriage is uh, every unbelievers marriage is like that only there are so many marriages which is uh, I saw that um, you know they are living a good family life um, far better than Christian's marriage so that is also there. But when we look to the uh, believers, I also find that um, even though we have uh, all the privileges, but uh, even I saw that uh, there are worst uh, things happens in believers marriage. Like it doesn't, uh, I also saw that like, um, you know, even though Jesus is this, uh, um, they, they call themselves as believers. They are uh, born in a Christian family. They come together. But there is that lifestyle. There is in the lifestyle. There is no purity. There is no holiness. Um, uh, you know, there is no faithfulness with each other. And uh, if you look, if you say that okay, that is an believer's marriage. It should be blessed la the way how uh, we think or the what the Bible says. And uh, at, that never happens. And um, so, so I I think so that uh, you know, 
it again it depends upon uh, whether it is a believer or it's an unbeliever it is a person who it is their individual responsibility that uh, you know that they should take care of each other and um, you know their commitment for each other they should maintain their purity and holiness because i saw i saw that even an unbelievers marriages also they are, they live in purity they they keep their marriage so pure and secure even though they are absence or in the absence of god but there are so many marriages i saw in the believers life that uh, they have spoiled and they are at the edge of divorce or so many things that's my observation thank you pastor absolutely thank you thank you so i think even uh, anita has put up that observation she said sometimes we just married to a christian and not a believer and uh, their idea of marriage is based on the example set by their parents leading to continue the same mistakes that are carried by previous generation so uh, i i do agree it's not just about being a believer but also being following what god's word says that really makes uh, the marriage fruitful um so someone who does place their trust in god should also be able to work out uh, their righteousness um yes so i do agree with that susan susan i think you had also put up your hand would yes, you like to share yes susan go ahead uh one of my church believer girl she got uh, married to an unbeliever boy so before marriage uh, she was a good prayer warrior she used to come to church and pray for hours but after marriage she used to come but uh, not regularly in between so one day she opened a garment shop for, to start a business and uh, she asked her husband permission for prayer he said okay you can pray so she called us church uh, believers and we went and we prayed for that shop and within after prayer what he did he was a buddhist he brought a picture of uh, uh, ambedkar and he also uh, called his friends and they started to do their uh, prayer so that was very uh, means ashamed and she started crying so such kind of conflicts occur absolutely thank you susan yes you, we may see it in different forms and different sizes um i know personally i uh, you know i have friends who you know believers who've been married to unbelievers um and uh, you know discuss about how even little decisions that they take become very conflicting because um, there's one person who's very practical oriented the other person says you know i want to wait on god and find out the answer and then there are issues with that there are issues with times of devotion times of how you how you discipline children in the ways of the lord you know in scripture uh, there can be a, a difficulty in the way that they see marriage in itself you know i think there's one couple uh who significantly struggle with um, uh with having the interference of other family members and the the spouse feels that you know as parents they are close to god and they should be given first priority whereas uh the other spouse knows scripture says that you know the 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 unit is one and uh, should be stronger than anything else so there can be very many reasons and ways of how uh issues turn out you know when when a when two people are married and who are who have a difference in their faith not just spiritually but even in the practical ways of life so what does one do okay what does scripture teach us in such situations um would someone i'm on page 132 would someone read um first corinthians 7 12 to 16 and somebody else can read first peter 3 1 and 2 so first corinthians 7 12 to 16 and 1 peter 3 1 and 2 you could just quickly unmute and read read out loud okay first corinthians 7 12 to 16 to the others i say i myself not the lord if a christian man has a wife who is an unbeliever and she agrees to go on living with him he must not divorce her and if a christian woman is married to a man who is an unbeliever and he agrees to go on living with her she must not divorce him 
for the unbelieving husband is made acceptable to God by being united to his wife and the unbelieving wife is made acceptable to God by being united to her Christian husband if this were not so the children would be like pagan children but as it is they are acceptable to God however if the one who is not a believer wishes to leave the Christian partner let it be so in such cases the Christian partner whether husband or wife is free to act God has called you to live in peace how can you be sure Christian wife that you will not save your husband or how can you be sure Christian husband that you will not save your wife amen Thank you Charles thank you someone else first peter 3:1 and 2 first yes, peter ma'am. first peter 3:1 and 2 go ahead go ahead prabaka i think it was prabaka who who started please go ahead go ahead somebody somebody can read okay i'll read eh Yes can it in the Go same ahead. way in the same way you wives must submit yourselves to your husbands so that if any of them do not believe God's word your conduct will win them over to believe it will not be necessary for you to say a word because they will see how you are and reverent your conduct is thank you thank you kennedy so through these two these two scriptures uh, some instructions that we are to maintain to call for is one um we if the unbelieving spouse and the believing spouse is willing to live together peacefully to not divorce one another okay they continue to um uh, just the role of the believing wife as we you know as we had spoken about and as we had learned is to be in respect and in submission to her unbelieving husband but this is of course only if it is as unto the lord that is uh, there shouldn't be any um it shouldn't be against the word of god her submission to the husband is not is it shouldn't be against the word of god so um, avoiding divorce if they are willing to peacefully live together be in submission and respect to the unbelieving um, husband um, or you know love and care for and lead the unbelieving wife um, as long as it is in the lord and not in violation of your faith and what god's word says okay so that's one the second is to know um you know we see this in um first corinthians 7 verse um uh verse 14 it says if uh, their children would be like pagan children but as it is they are acceptable to god so through the faith of the believing spouse um uh, there is you know it they are made there is a blessing for the unbelieving spouse as well as their children because of your faith in him i think some versions also point out i'm 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 just going to look just give me a minute i'm just going to look at the um other versions that talk about this and i think the word that is used there is sanctified um i'm just uh, finding that yeah so in the uh, kjv i think or even in the nkjv in the kjv it's written that the unbelieving spouse um uh, unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife okay that is they are consecrated or they made holy they are purified um because of the unbelieving spouse so they they are sanctified okay um and so also the other way so we see that the, you know that that is the um that's that's the instruction that's given and lastly that only if the unbelieving spouse chooses to leave the marriage or abandons the marriage should 
they be allowed to leave okay then the spouse the believing spouse can uh, dissolve the marriage and move forward so the instruction given is if they continue to stay it is important that they stay but if not they are allowed to move forward um no it uh, okay so beth your your question was unbelieving spouse is sanctified does that mean saved for eternity no it does not mean saved for eternity each person uh, needs to come to a personal relationship with god to uh, for uh, um to for eternity this sanctification is to uh, a blessing you know when you pray or when as as a member of the family when you ha have uh, your faith in god the rest of the members are recipients of the faith that you share so the blessing uh, you know they partake in the blessing that they have but definitely not for eternity it is it's not uh, each person has to have their own relationship with god has to come to their own confession and believing with god it's not saved for eternity but they have the blessings of god while they are here right i hope i clarified that so that's that's what it would mean when you say they are acceptable to god where they are um, there is a blessing upon their lives uh, at this point of time but not not eternal not salvation salvation doesn't come over them it's it's a blessing that there is okay uh, moving on it is we're going to look at instructions god has given for with regard to divorce and marriage okay so i'm again on page um, page 120 33 uh, would someone please read uh, the verses malachi 2 14 and 16 um and uh, we will read Matthew 19 3 and 9 there are a couple of verses we will just probably read the verse in Malachi 2 14 and 16 and Matthew 19 3 to 9 please go ahead yes would somebody like to read go on malachi 2 14 you are ask why he no longer accepts them it is because he knows you you have broken your promise to the wife you have you married when you were young she was your partner and you have broken your promise to her although you promised for god that you would be faithful to her didn't god make you one body and spirit with her what was his purpose in this it was that you should have children who are truly god's people so make sure that none of you breaks his promise to his wife i hate divorce as the lord god of israel i hate it when one of you does such a cruel thing to his wife make sure you do not break your promise to be faithful to your wife thank you christopher would someone read matthew 193 to 9 that's on the next page i think now the same matthew. page 133 go ahead matthew 193 to 9 some pharisees came to him and tried to trap him by asking Does our law allow a man to divorce his wife for whatever reason he wishes? Jesus answered, "Haven't you read the scripture that says that in the beginning the creator made people male and female? And God said, 'For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and unite with his wife, and the two will become one. So they are no longer two, but one. No human being must separate then what God has joined together.'" the pharisees asked him why then did moses give the law for a man to hand his wife a divorce notice and send her away jesus answered moses gave you permission to divorce your wives because you are so hard to teach but it was not like that at the time of creation i tell you then that any man who divorces his wife for any cause other than her unfaithfulness commits adultery if he marries some other woman 
Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Okay. So through these scriptures, there are a couple more, but I've just taken uh, the few that, you know, will highlight the point that we want to bring up is, uh, it makes scripture is clear that God is against divorce. He does not appro approve of divorce. And that is our greater understanding. Okay. Um, so, I've seen often, even, you know, as people, uh, uh, couples work, have been having conflicts, the word divorce and separation is used extremely flippantly, okay? And uh, the instruction is not to, uh, you know, not the instruction, but, you know, it is very unhealthy when couples bring about this word and then, then they keep throwing that out, you know, if we can't get in together, let's, let's divorce. So it's not an option that a marriage should consider okay now there may be times that uh, you know so, so I'm, I'm, I'm giving you um, uh, situations like let's say where there is violence okay? there is significant violence in in the marriage where, where there is there is a, a person's life one of the spouse's life is threatened in such cases uh, you do the best you can to keep the marriage going, maybe uh, initially it is probably to temporarily separate for a period of time till help is sought, till things are worked out, uh, not considering divorce as a solution to the problems, but to, um, to work on it as best as possible. So I have this uh, couple who I'm currently working with, where this the husband has been into alcohol addiction for over 15 years. And it's a cycle over and over again. It's been a cycle. Uh, they, they're believers, um, yet the husband has is into an addiction. So the wife has been, you know, continuously uh, working, praying, you know, supporting going through a lot of uh, extreme stress, I think very, very uh, similar to what um, Charles was talking about. But the last episode, it so happened that the husband in his intoxication, um, uh, you know, went for the throat of the wife, you know, was all, choked her. And uh, she had to call for help. And uh, if, if the kids did not come in, and young children, you know, ages of 10 and 8, if the children hadn't come in, probably she would have passed out. So in a condition like that, uh, you know, they, they, she has decided uh, to move away for a, a particular period of time till he's willing to get uh, get into rehabilitation, get the help that he wants, and then see how he progresses and then come back. So the divorce was not an option. Now, these, these situations are extremely hard, but she was aware that divorce was not an option, but needed to know that, you know, she couldn't enable the behavior like that, but needed to have him um, get in for help because it was further affecting their lives and the lives of the children. So not considering divorce as a solution, but, you know, if there requires a period of separation um, to work through this, that's when you look at it, okay? Scripture shows that there are only two reasons for why divorce should take place. One is adultery, as we saw in Matthew 19.9, and uh, either and abandonment, what we saw in the previous scripture in 1 Corinthians 7.15, that if an unbelieving partner or a partner uh, leaves, um, you know, abandons, then they are uh, free to choose divorce. However, even in these situations, the attempt is to restore and heal the marriage only after good effort has been made, help has been taken, would you be free to exercise the choice. Okay, um, Maybe other situations where there could be um, neglect or there is, uh, um, uh, you know, any kind of a destructive behavior uh, that sometimes could lead to separation and divorce. Um, sometimes there may be one partner who is willing to to work on the marriage, but the other opts out. Um, then, you know, we 
uh, we do understand that this may not be what God approves and desires of, yet they may choose to make that decision. And when such situations happen, and I, I'm sure we all have come across people uh, who have been divorced, right? As believers, what should our response be? That those who are going through divorce uh, are in significant, painful, and difficult situations. And we, we need to be careful not to pass judgment, not to uh, single them out, not to come to a place of, uh, uh, you know, ensuring that, uh, you know, you, you speak correction, but to be, a, to be in a place of grace, grace, grace and gentleness and support them through that. Because uh, we know that in every situation, whatever choices we make, it is only the grace and the mercy of God that works in our lives, okay? Uh, so if now, there may be times that in the course of time, if they are being led to remarry, we we often, you know, we, we take that to bless them as well. However, we do bring about scripture that says, which we are going to be looking at, you know, apart from remarriage is possible only if there is death. We bring about that scripture back to them. However, uh, you know, we pray that God would lead them into the right choice. And even as we're saying that, we want to be careful that we do not support these, uh, you know, these cyclical divorce, remarriage, divorce, remarriage that happens in uh, maybe in certain parts of, of our culture where, where marriage needs to be looked at as an institution to be honored. So we support remarriage only within a context of biblical instruction and knowing that, you know, it's God's heart and mind that that is that that has helped the person make this decision. Yes, Samuel, you had a question. Samuel, did you have a question? Yes, yes. Yes, Sorry. go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking um, with children in in perspective. Um, so, uh, you know. Yes, divorce is definitely uh, not an option, definitely not. So, uh, but um, so uh, one aspect that I that I've often heard, uh, you know, thrown around also is, uh, let's say, a husband and wife refuse to see eye to eye, and there is more conflict at home. Uh, the father and mother constantly fighting. You know, screaming and shouting, bringing down each other. It's really an unhealthy environment for the children. And uh, I don't know if the Bible says anything much about that. I mean, how kids were brought up back then and how the, the environment that surrounds uh, children now uh, with depression on the rise, suicide rates on the rise. And and we often see that kid children coming from uh, families that are either broken or even families that you know, have so much conflict. It, it affects their personalities. Um, so in, in the light of that, so, you know, even then, then there's, there's, there's no unfaithfulness, there's, there's no thing, but, but husband and wife, they just, there's just so much fight. Um, one, I think, easy option that a lot of parents resort to is putting the kids in the hostel, in, in, mm. in boarding schools, which again, I feel, I mean, I went to boarding from grade one and I, I, I don't see that as a very good thing. You know, I, I feel kids should stay with their parents and should be raised by their parents. However, kids being raised by parents who themselves are conflicted and, and are fighting all the time. You know, so a anything that you want, you want, you want to, I mean, I think it affects the kids a lot. And, and it's not no longer just the two individuals. I mean, they are selfish, and uh, obviously they're thinking just about themselves. But these kids who are like sponges, soaking everything, and are watching their parents putting down each other all the time. How does that affect? And and um, what should believers do? Um, how can mm -hmm. uh, like what sort of intervention should come at all? Mm. So, Samuel, uh, absolutely, these are extremely hard situations. 
um, you know, when we when we're going to be looking into the parenting um, uh, chapters on parenting, we will begin to see that a home, a good home for a children, involves the unity of parents, and when that doesn't happen, children are exasperated. In fact, Ephesians six talks about it: uh, fathers do not exasperate your children, right? So. There are times and there are uh, situations where parents continue to be in severe conflict with each other, the children being pulled into a dilemma like this. And uh, so the instructions that I think we can pick from here is one, if it begins to significantly affect the children, uh, I mean, the word significant is is so relative, you know, even even any, anything that is not at peace at home can affect a child. And it, it really depends on how a child takes it. I mean, there could be one child who's able to take a lot and someone who just can't even stand the fact that the parents don't even talk to each other, right? Or that they, they seem angry. They have just uh, difficult expressions on their faces. So yeah, even as I'm saying that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't, make holistic sense however um, to to know that if there are uh, if it's significantly affecting like like i said in this case um, the children were exposed to uh, you know the sense of a violence over the over the mother and uh, there there were earlier times where the father lashed out on the children hit the child when the safety of children mental health concerns of children are at stake, um, probably a wiser thing to do is to stay separated for a point of time till it, uh, the couple can get help and ways through which they could learn to cooperate with one another. Uh, and even as I'm saying this, I think I need to help us understand that maybe not all couples even after counseling, come together, you know, like a unified team. Sometimes that doesn't happen. But what you're hoping to give them is at least some code of conduct. How, uh, you know, taking away their focus of themselves and for the sake of the children, bringing up a home that seems the, the least conflicting. Okay, so... There are times when couples are willing, they, they don't see eye to eye at all. There is absolute disagreement between the two. But through counseling sessions, they come up with an understanding that, okay, we will decide that these things is something we will not do. Okay, we don't, we, so, so that definitely requires a lot of engaging in time, being intentional about it, keeping away one's ego, keeping away one's need for power, for authority, all of that. So that this takes significant periods of time because a lot of times couples are so much wallowing in their pain and their hurt that they want themselves to win, right? So they have to come to a place that the focus no more is on them because if they are not able to unite together, the next doable goal is focus on the children. And so there are times that that has also happened. You know, that's not an ideal situation. I, I do say that's not an ideal situation. You are called to be together in love. But there may be times that that just doesn't help uh, happen because of the personalities of the people who we are involved in. So in a case like this, I, number one, say, you know, if it's significantly affecting the children, take a time of, take a period of separation where you are, willing to get back and working on it, even maybe from a distance to a point of time. So I have couples who are doing that, you know, who don't live together, but live separate, but still do come for counseling just to support, just because they care about the children and how this is going to impact them. And I see that's so beautiful because, you know, um, when, when God said the children are a gift, actually, that's what melts many parents to, or many couples to, um, live in peace with one another, you know, build down their egos or, uh, you know, be willing to overcome uh, good for evil. And and the way that God's instituted is perfect. I mean, if I, I'd say if, if there weren't children in the equation, 
you know, we'd have many people walking out because there is nothing that's keeping them there, right? Unless, of mm. course, they believe that it is the faith that they have in God. So, yeah, this is uh, the best answer I can give. I know not an easy one. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we we look into the uh, um, next one, which is the death of a spouse. What happens uh, in the death of a spouse? And uh, I'll probably just pick up one or two scriptures. There's a lot more of scripture. You can take some time to read it. I'm reading through Psalm 68, verse 5. It says, a father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. Uh, Psalm 146.9 the Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. So uh, we know that losing um, a spouse to death is is an extremely, um, uh, you know, if, if you look at, uh, you know, there is something called as a stress scale. And uh, the highest stress in a human being is um, uh, felt at the death of a spouse or a child, okay? So we see that it is an extremely painful thing, but scripture shows that um, the Lord is the one who brings about comfort. The Lord is the one who brings about defense, who watches, who relieves, who is, is the one who establishes the, the living spouse, okay? And with God's help uh, to get to get them back on, on moving forward, completing whatever is left in store for them. Okay, We also see from uh, 1 Timothy 5, 3 to 16, I'm not going through that, but it shows how um, as a body of Christ and maybe as extended family, there are instructions that are given as to how you take care of those who've been uh, to take care of those who are widowed, okay, and you will see um, a, a lot of things that that have been given that that are given as instructions. So, being able to minister to them, to support them, to comfort them, uh, uh, n n ensuring that there is a protection for them and and not left to any kind of an exploitation. So that's from First Timothy five three to sixteen. You can just take some time to read it. The last part we're going to be looking at is death and and um, remarriage. Um, in this, there are two verses I'd want to bring up. Maybe someone could read these two verses. This is Romans 7, 2 and 3. That's on page 135. Romans 7, 2 and 3, and 1 Corinthians 7, 8 to 9. If someone can read those two verses, please. Romans 7, verses 2 and 3. For instance, a wife is legally tied to her husband where he lives. But if he dies, she is free. If she lives with another man while her husband is living, she is obviously an adulteress. But if he dies, she is quite free to marry another man in good conscience with no one's disapproval. You could go ahead and read First Corinthians 7, 8 to 9 also, Sam. Thank you. 1 Corinthians 7, 8 to 9. Now to the unmarried and to the widows, I say that it would be better for you to continue to live alone as I do. But if you cannot restrain your desires, go ahead and marry. It's better to marry than to burn with passion. Right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So the instruction that's given here is that a widow or a widower is free to be married um, uh, once uh, if if they choose or if they desire to, uh, after the death of their spouse, um, and we we as even as a church we support that and we uh, we come alongside to help and bless their lives. However, having said so, it is important that if there is a remarriage that takes place, there should be definite preparation because it is um, it it is again a place of adjustment where there are two families coming together, probably each having their own uh, set of children, where they're going to come together to, uh, to come into a blended family. A blended family is one where there are children from either sides of the spouse, 
the, uh, either side of the couples that come together that becomes a blended family. So being able to, to prepare themselves on working with each other and uh, also in a way that helps the entire family come together and uh, um, uh, join together in love and and um, working together as a new family so there should be prior preparation that happens if, when a person does choose to remarry okay so we looked at these four challenges we looked at um, an unsaved spouse we looked at the death uh, of a spouse we looked at death and remarriage and uh, divorce uh, and remarriage so we've, we've looked at the biblical instructions of this and um, uh, do the best to adhere to whatever god has instituted um, however there could be cases in which um, there 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 may be other choices that are made um, we ask for the lord's wisdom and uh, seek the Lord through each of these choices and wait upon the Lord when these instructions may not go as per what scripture has, has, has seen. But we yet believe and, and know that what God has said in his word is what he approves of. All right. Um, quickly, uh, if there are no questions, we could pr uh, close with a word of prayer. Is there any questions, any observations? A quick one or two minute, and we can uh, close. Okay, uh, maybe not. All right. May I request uh, uh, Prabhaka? Would you please close with a word of prayer? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Father, we thank you, Lord. Father, we come to your presence. Father, we want to thank you for all the instructions, for your guidance, for your help, Lord. Father, we know, Lord, this marriage and family is sensitive, oh, Father. We know, God, you are more interested oh, than us, oh, Father. You instituted marriage, oh, Father. You instituted family, oh, Father. Father, we pray, oh, God, Jesus, that we will be able to follow your word and Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit will guide us to the Father, to be victorious, O oh Father, even in this area, O oh Father, to glorify your name, O oh Father. We pray that you will bless each and every one of us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Prabhaka. Thank you all. Uh, Samuel, you said, wondering how, uh, wondering how the unmarried amongst us are feeling <laughs> okay yet i think it'll be good to hear uh, what the unmarried uh, are feeling it's it's uh, you know god's there god's in control guys so uh, just completely lay your hands on him and he will lead you through Thank you. Have a good and blessed week ahead. A reminder of the assessment once again. Please do complete it before the 5th of November. God bless. God go with you. May you experience and enjoy the communion of the Holy Spirit. Bye-bye. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.